The uncanny corner of the From the Ashes era begins when Rogue, Gambit, and Wolverine ponder their place in the world with mixed results. Do the mutants have a home after the fall of Krakoa? Should there be an X-Men? Well, let's find out in our review of Uncanny X-Men number one from Marvel Comics. See you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Uncanny X-Men number one. Wow. You know what, let me just start it off by saying I'm a comic reader. That shouldn't surprise anyone, but I, I read comics because I love the stories. I love the characters, I like the worlds they inhabit, I love all of it. On top of that, I'm also an X-Men fan. The only time I ever subscribed to get a comic delivered to me in the mail when I was a wee young lad was to get a copy of the X-Men. Didn't do that for Superman, didn't do that for Batman, it was only the X-Men that I ever went through that trouble to get a comic in my hands. I'm telling you this, because I want to like the X-Men. And so now we come to the latest debut from Tom Brevoort's From the Ashes era, Uncanny X-Men number one, written by Gail Simone with art by David Marquez. And I'm just going to tell you up front, I want to like this comic. I really do. But it's off. And it's off for a couple of reasons that I'll get to in a little bit. But just to say, it's not a winner. By way of setup, the issue really centers around Rogue, Gambit, and Wolverine who are struggling to figure out who they are and what their purpose is in life after Krakoa. And that's a key bit of information I'll talk about later. Wolverine is done picking fights. Gambit is just happy to be along for the ride, loving his wife, Rogue. And Rogue, for her part, is down in the dumps worse than anyone else. She had a family and now it's fractured, scattered, and just overall uncertain. Let's just dig right into the issue. The trio of Rogue, Gambit, and Wolverine meet outside Mexico City. And the reason they're getting together is to fight this Quetzalcoatl-ish type dragon named Sadarang, who recently appeared in Savage Avengers number 14 through 16. With a brief bit of fighting, which is the only action in this comic, Gambit dislodges an eye of Agamotto, which is embedded in the dragon's chest, and threatens to destroy the eye if the dragon doesn't go to Antarctica for a year to cool off. Before the dragon leaves, it foretells of a dark force on the move by using the name Endling. Something or someone named Endling is coming and it's going to bring trouble to everyone. Without spoiling the back and forth critique, which we'll get to a little bit later, right off you can tell something's a little bit odd. What is the point of this scene? I have no idea. Maybe the eye will play a part in something coming up. Maybe the dragon will play some part in a story that's coming one year down the road. Who knows? It's unclear because this little scene or vignette, if you will, has no bearing on the rest of the comic. It just seems like a reason to get Rogue and Gambit together with Wolverine to fight a dragon in Mexico City for some reason out of the blue. Suddenly the issue switches to a scene in Oregon where a mutant codenamed Fawn, for obvious reasons, her, her physical appearance is she has hooves and horns, is pursued by men with cattle prods. Fawn is eventually taken down and then something with that comes out of the shadows with very long fingers and very long nails comes in and swoops her up, sort of. We never really see the end of the sequence. Presumably it's there to set up a big bad, whoever this person is that captured Fawn, but it's like the very smallest of hints and you have no idea where it connects in. And again, that scene doesn't come up again anywhere else in the comic. Then the comic switches to another scene. Again, we head out to Mississippi after Rogue gets a call from Nightcrawler to come to a hospital. The team, if you want to call it that, visits a boy with low-level psychic powers who is also dying from cancer. The boy is a huge X-Men fan, so the visit puts a smile on his face because he's thrilled. This is very much a, like a make-a-wish type of scenario. But the smile fades pretty quickly when all of a sudden he has a seizure, and that seizure leads to his death. During the seizure, however, he has a precog vision and mentions a name, Endling. Remember that name from the dragon? The death hits everyone really hard, but Rogue almost falls apart grief-stricken. Then we switch locations again. The group decides to heal and regroup, if you will, from their grief after the boy's death. And they go to this house in New Orleans owned by a friend of Gambit's, where they decide that they need to consider what they're doing. They have no idea if they should still be heroes anymore. They don't know if they should be a team anymore. And they don't know if the X-Men even exist anymore. Now there's they're sitting around this campfire outside the house and drinking beers and just sort of chilling and relaxing. All of a sudden, a group of mutants comes out of the woods, very similar to that fawn character. They seem to be sort of nature-based, but maybe not. And these are new characters that I don't think we've ever seen before. And the group comes out of the woods saying, hey, we need help. 
But before it ends, there is a little bit of connected tissue that actually started in the prologue. We're introduced to a character by the name of Dr. Korea Ellis, who leads an effort to convert Xavier's school into a mutant prison. She is henceforth then named Warden Ellis, and she now wants to take everything that's in the mansion, strip it all out, destroy anything that was reminiscent of the students who were there, sell off anything that was valuable, and turn all the rooms into prison cells. Presumably that is a second big bad that'll play a factor in this series going forward. And that's it. So let's talk about the highlights of what was good, what was great, and what was not great, and hopefully you can decide for yourself. So what do we like about this? Let's start with the art because that's an easier talking point to get through. David Marquez's artwork is fantastic. As you can surmise from the description, there's a lot of talking, a lot of displays of emotion. There's a little bit of action with the dragon in the beginning, but there's not much to it, to be honest with you. But still, Marquez carries it off beautifully. There is lots of great facial acting. The character designs were all fantastic, and it all comes together in a beautiful visual package. In terms of the positive aspects of the storytelling, Gail Simone nails those small, intimate moments with personality and heart. There's a lot of pain being carried by these mutants in this book, and you, you can feel them wear that pain on their sleeves. Simone's writing shines in the conveyance of the, the bonds and the relationship and the personal connections that you don't see many writers these days handle nearly as well. Most comics these days, a lot of people are just sort of talking at each other and they're loud and it's, it's very shouty. Here, it's quiet, it feels natural, it feels organic. And then on that count, Gail Simone does this series justice. Okay, so that was the good. Let's talk about what's not good. If you take a holistic view of this comic and where it sits with the other X titles, there are two internal problems that are specific to this book and one external problem that is having a negative impact on this book. And those things combined are absolutely going to get in the way of bringing on new readers and bringing back old readers. Let's start with the first part. The first internal problem or the problem that's specific to this book is the scattered plot. There's a team here, and I say that team in quotes, they're here, they're there, they're everywhere without rhyme or reason. Some destinations make sense, like you know when they regroup in New Orleans because that's Gambit's old stomping grounds and it's a quiet place and they can sit and ponder and think. That makes sense. Other things do not. Why did they go in the out of this blue decision to go confront a sleeping dragon outside Mexico City? There seems like things that are happening at random and loosely pieced together. And then on top of that, why would you have two scenes in different locations with different characters where the name Endling, which is very specific, is mentioned, and yet nobody bothers to stop and say, hey, doesn't anybody find that kind of strange? Why would a dragon say Endling and this low precog kid who's dying of cancer also say Endling and they're even in two different countries? Maybe that's something we should look into? No, it doesn't even come up. So there's a lot of things that are happening with random connections. Each scene in and of itself is relatively well done. But collectively, the issue is unfocused and disjointed. The second internal problem is just a complete lack of energy. Everyone is glum, they're depressed, they're burned out. Nobody wants to be here. There's no excitement or enthusiasm expressed by any character in this book except the hospital kid dying of cancer. The X-Men, and they're not even sure if they should be called X-Men anymore, act like they need a break from the world. And that attitude comes across on every single page. If I were a new reader and I picked up this comic, there's not one wow moment, not one exciting hook to get me to come back for more. Probably the, the only way you can really describe it is this book is just plain depressing. And I don't know anyone who wants to pick up an, an action adventure comic with superheroes that wants to be depressed. If the uh, goal was to kind of bring new readers on as a jumping point, on that point, they, they fail miserably. And that brings us to the third problem, which is really external, but it has an inescapable impact on, on the issue here. Tom Brevoort and the From the Ashes team of X writers either can't or won't let go of Krakoa. You get little references and bits of dialogue that keep referencing what was, what the mutants had, what it meant to their lives, and how their lives have lost meaning now that it's over. They will not let it go. This all comes back to Tom Brevoort and the X office in the From the Ashes era and just the fundamental edict of what they're trying to do. All the X titles released so far, including this one, carry around this dried out husk of a corpse called Krakoa, like a stone around their collective necks. They desperately want to move on, but they're incapable of letting it go. It's like some weird, perverse, twisted version of Weekend at Bernie's without any of the humor. You just have this dead body that's there 
that everyone sees and tries to acknowledge it but not really pay attention to it and never really interact with it but it's just there or it's like one of those senior citizens who have their favorite pet stuffed after it dies so that the pet and its owner will always be together. It's some kind of pall of sadness to the ex-titles because the editors and the writers either can't or won't acknowledge that Krakoa ultimately failed. It started off great and then it fell apart pretty quickly after mm, basically the first year. Thanks, Jordan White. That's your fault. They can't acknowledge that it failed and they're forced to start over while they keep a little picture of the island in a tarnished, rusty locket. It's sad to the point of being pathetic and you just want to get rid of and be done with it it's like a oh, i know i keep using analogies but it's like a bad breakup with somebody who was bad for you you knew they were bad for you your friends can see they were bad for you and now that you're broken up you have this opportunity to kind of move forward and move on but you keep pining for that relationship even though it wasn't healthy let go and move forward so let me be clear about this is this a terrible comic in general no it's perfectly fine it's okay the art is great and Gail Simone's character moments flow with some authenticity and some strong emotional depth. The interactions between the characters feel very natural and organic. So that there's some pieces to like in here. However, the plot and the X office as a whole feels lost. And until they find their way again, and I mean without Krakoa, this title's not gonna win any new readers over. It's not gonna bring back old readers with all the them and vigor and enthusiasm that they that we used to have from 20, 30 years ago, and it would just continue to sit there and wallow in its grief for what could have been. Final thoughts, what do you think about Uncanny X-Men number one? You almost get the band back together in the first issue with heartfelt character moments, but it's overshadowed by a scattered, unfocused plot. Gail Simone nails those character voices, and David Marquez's art is outstanding, especially when you have these expressions of deep, serious emotion. That all looks great but the issue feels more like a collection of random scenes of sadness than an adventure comic with a renewed purpose. And that pervasive shadow of Krakoa's passing lingers, I don't know, like a ghost of a deceased spouse who won't let the living move on. Therefore, Uncanny X-Men number one from Marvel Comics earns a six out of 10. The technical quality in the writing and the art is there. If you're looking at the structure of it, but this is a sad, depressing comic that almost tells you to go away and give it some healing space. But that's our opinion. What do you think? Is Uncanny X-Men your most anticipated comic in the From the Ashes era? Give us a thumbs up if it is and leave us a comment below if you're looking forward to another X title or already have your favorite in your hands. Also, remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review and buy this comic to help support the channel. That would be greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.